know, like it's back on YouTube. That's amazing, man. I'm I'm happy. <laughs> yeah, we got the clips back on, but it's still they still got ripped. Yeah. Oh, we're I, I I said this on Facebook and I really credit him for like, um, you know, like he was one of my inspirations for me wanting to start a podcast. Really, like I used to watch his shows before I even started doing shows. And like he was always bringing like cutting edge information forward, like with always like the best guests. And he's like he's like me, you know, in a, in a sense that he doesn't really have a biased opinion towards anything. He's kind of just lets the information present itself. And I love that about him. You could almost say he has like a Art Bell or George Nori type um, perspective on, I, I don't know if, if he likes that comparison, but you know, that's what I think when I, you know, and who I'm speaking of is Chris Matthew of Forbidden Knowledge News. He's the CEO of the Forbidden Knowledge News Network and the podcast Forbidden Knowledge News is mainly on Rockfin, but it's also on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Odyssey, Rumble. And today we're going to be talking about um, his new documentary, which I got a chance to see. It's the, the first part of it. It's a cult, Louisiana. And I've always loved Louisiana with, you know, the voodoo and hoodoo in New Orleans and the culture down there. It's so rich in culture. And, and we're also going to be getting into like some UFO news and conspiracies and stuff. So it's going to be a fun show. So buckle up, everybody. And I hope everybody's having a great Saturday. And with all, oh, and by the way, just join the Patreon and join the Discord. The Discord's free. People like to seem to like to go in there and chop it up after podcasts and stuff. So that's always there for you guys. And the Patreon is more for like unreleased content. But with all that said, I want to give a big warm welcome to my guest today. Chris, thank you for joining me. How are you? Hey, man, Robert, thank you so much for having me back on. It was a blast last time. Looking forward to this one. Let's get weird. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, we can make people's Saturday nights a little bit better. Oh, so yeah. uh, the, the first thing I wanted to cover before we get into the documentary is kind of like the UFO news, which there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. Um, and I figured you might have an opinion on it, but it's it's kind of hard to nail down like what's exactly going on. And what I'm talking about is there's like Greer's press conference. Then there was like the whistleblower, David Grush, who supposedly came out. Then there was the story of the aliens landing in Vegas, which I'll tell you what, like I really don't believe the story of the aliens in Vegas. I think that's a little too far fetched, but there might be something to that Grush dude. I, I don't know. I have no clue. Like, you know, and, and also uh, Greer's press conference was interesting because what I'll just tell you what I thought about that was he kind of, I mean, like, you know, obviously there's some shows out there saying that Greer's a grifter and stuff like that. But like, I think it does cost money to put these things together. I, I don't know. I don't really have an opinion, but like, you know, um, I think that he, it was interesting that he brought military witnesses forward that said that we have this UFO technology and that we've had it for a long time. You know, what I, I don't know. What, what were your thoughts on all that stuff? Well, I have not followed the the Greer conference because of the last few days I've been in the last editing stages of the the the, the docu series and the first episode and stuff. But I've I've peeked in here and there, and I followed little bits and pieces of it. But ever since the, the government and our mainstream media started telling us that UFOs and UAPs were real and it's okay to talk about it now, that sent red flags up for me because they don't have the best record of ever telling the truth about anything in our history. So why are they going to start now with UFOs? But I, I have always, this has like been one of my favorite topics. Always is one of the things that got me into this broadcasting is UFOs and aliens. And I'm fascinated with it. I've had my own sort of con what you could, might consider contact experiences. We discussed that a little bit the last time I was on here. So it is a topic that's near and dear to my heart, but the way I perceive it and the way I feel about it has changed dramatically over the years. And I, I, I am always in between the possibility of is this just a consciousness phenomenon where this is just non-corporeal intelligence interacting with us in a way that may seem physical to us or in a way that 
our perception can understand it or what we're aware enough to to receive from whatever this phenomena is or is it really physical beings that are coming from different planets to stick things in our butts and experiment on us or even <laughs> like the government wants to think that they're a threat and there could possibly be some kind of future type of confrontations with aliens. Uh, this was seeming like what is being built up. There's a lot of speculation on whether or not this could be like a project blue beam thing, a fake invasion thing. I consider it. I don't know for sure. I consider a lot of things when it comes to this, but I am very weary with the information that is presented from our own government and our mainstream media. And even some of the quote unquote whistleblowers that have come forward lately. I mean, only certain information is going to be allowed to be presented on our mainstream media by our mainstream facilitators of information, if you want to call it that at times, which we've understood that in the past couple of years, that a lot of what we once considered to be conspiracies has actually come true. And we've been lied to on a lot of fronts when it comes to a lot of what's presented in our reality by our mainstream media and our own government. So going back to that, what they've been presenting in the past few months is that they've been interacting with things that they are not 100% sure if they are from our planet. If they are, they could be, they are presenting it, that it could be non-human intelligences. It could be non-human entities, UFOs. And we still have no definitive proof that what we see in the sky and understand as UFOs is even connected to extraterrestrials or aliens or even the abduction phenomena as a whole. Now, there are, there's some evidence that it's connected, but we don't have any proof of anything on that front as well. So there's a lot of convoluted information coming out. I think there's a lot of people being put up in the UFO community intentionally to spread misinformation and disinformation. A lot of what we consider whistleblowers and people that used to be involved with the government and military industrial complex and FBI and CIA and claiming to work at Area 51 and claiming to be crash retrieval uh, people that deal with this stuff. So it's very interesting. Uh, to see that the information is coming out right now. And I think that there is something to the phenomena, but I think what is being presented could be a psychological operation of some sort, whether it's for a future alien invasion, whether it's just to cause uh, confusion, whether it's to roll, maybe the military just wants to roll out some new toys or distract us, or it's the next version of what just happened in 2020 with the whole ogada boogada jabba jabba da yabba yabba da thing that we... <laughs> Just here, so it could be that you know a next version of a cycle op major psychological operation like that that's coming out. Who knows? But it's interesting. It is very interesting. And the whole Vegas thing, I was I followed that story, and that does seem a little strange. It seems a little odd. The characters involved seem to be not completely on the up and up. Even the police officer was acting strangely. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if they're actors or if they were put up to it or if this is some sort of hoax, but there's something just off about that whole that whole thing. Um, I, I respect Dr. Greer and I, I respect the information, what he's trying to bring forward and everything. And I think he has good intentions. You know, uh, I think he may not have you know the best track record when it comes to some of the things going on with him personally, which translate into his believability and his respectability. But that's something completely different. So we got some interesting situations happening right now with with what we understand as UFOs. And of course, I'm going to keep an eye on it. I, I keep having wonderful, brilliant guests and researchers on to talk about their perception of what could be happening because there's most of my guests are here there because they're smarter than me and they know more than me about some of these topics. So uh, I would I would love to think that there are extraterrestrials visiting us from different planets, but I just tend to lean more of this is some sort of a spiritual personal consciousness exploration phenomenon that whatever this phenomenon is could be an intelligence communicating with us to help us evolve to a certain point. It's a possibility for me, but that's where I'm at with the whole UFO things. I, I like that. I like that you've always like, and I think this is one of the reasons why like me and a lot of people follow your show. It's because like you've never been afraid to like 
question the narrative and like push the envelope and like be a little bit skeptical and kind of state your opinion as to like how you feel. Like I wish I could do that a little bit more because I, I tend to be a little bit more skeptical. I just don't convey it as much, but I, you know, for me, it's like, if there's something I'd love to see it, but like, I'm like, I've had like spiritual experiences I've had, you know, with like psychedelics and stuff like that, which, and I've seen a lot, which makes me think that there's definitely something going on. So I, I think I would almost agree with you that I feel like this, there's something, there's something with, with this, with consciousness, it seems like, you know, and I think that's why people like at the Bigelow Institute spent like, I, I don't even know how much money researching consciousness, because I think they saw that from a, from an early stage and they, they wanted to get in on that as far as like trying to figure out what the phenomena was, you know what I mean? I, I, I don't know if they're doing what, if they're, what they're doing is right, but um, I definitely think there's a, a consciousness component to it, or, or maybe it might be all consciousness. Is that kind of what you're saying? Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And it is interesting. Like you're saying with what Bigelow is researching now with consciousness and they started out at Skinwalker Ranch with UFOs and this paranormal type of phenomena. And it seems to always lead to consciousness and something interesting about that whole type of Skinwalker Ranch exploration there. And not even specifically in that area, but in the Utah Basin, I've had Ryan Burns on a few times who lives out there and talks about the uh, the crazy phenomena going out there. But there's also a place in, uh, I believe in Alabama, it's called The Meadow, where they have, it's similar to Skinwalker Ranch, lots of UFOs, lots of different paranormal stuff. And we have these, these aerospace companies and interests that are looking into these places. But like you said, with Bigelow, it always eventually leads to spirituality, consciousness, exploration. My friend Ryan Burns deals a lot in this. He does a lot of what you would call magical rituals to try and interact with the phenomena. And what I find interesting is I followed both sides. I follow the people who go out there with a scientific approach and they have lots of, uh, they have lots of technical things with them. They have lots of equipment, lots of technology, and they are trying to approach it from a very scientific approach and understand it that way. But at times it's very aggressive what they're doing and not very respectful. And I see that the phenomenon, when it act, interacts with people that are approaching it that way, it tends to push back. It tends to be like five to ten steps ahead of the researchers trying to interact with it. And it always seems to cause problems if you're approaching this phenomenon the wrong way. So you can look at the things that happen. Even I, I you know, I don't really think what they're portraying on the history channel is you know it's a, it's a it's a lot for show it's a, it's a big it's a big mainstream type of production but a lot of what they are portraying is is actually the way the phenomena will interact with you it's like a trickster and you know it shuts down their equipment it's always 10 steps ahead it never lets them figure out what exactly is going on and it seems like we're not supposed to figure that out on some level that this phenomena is always going to be ahead of us but on the other hand when i when i hear the other folks that are approaching it from a more spiritual angle with in a more magical perspective the phenomena tends to interact with them, but in a more positive manner, and they get better results. And it, they, you know, they, they, they won't be able to document it scientifically, and people probably won't believe it. <laughs> but it's so interesting that they get better results interacting that way, the way that it's not provable. So, I find that really interesting about this whole parallel between UFOs and this paranormal phenomena thing. Yeah, somebody in the chat asked if you had your experience. Have you had an experience? I was going to say we talked about that last time. Her name's Lori. We Chris did have his experience. He it was his was kind of like induced off of meditation and a big combination between meditation and psychedelics, right, Chris? Like, well, the first experience he, was just meditation. That is when I made con my contact with what I understand now at this point as my spirit guides or even your higher self. It's something that I believe is a part of my consciousness that was uh, propelling me, but in a way, not part of myself. It, you could even consider it alien intelligence, but, and I'm not even sure exactly what it was I was interacting with, but then it did eventually become psychedelic induced. And uh, yeah, I've had plenty of experiences where I've interacted with what I consider non-human or non-corporeal intelligences. 
Yeah. Well, I, let's get into the reason why you're, you're really here today, which is your new documentary, um, for a cult Louisiana. And, and I, I'm really thankful to you for sending me a screener of it. It was an amazing documentary. Um, Thank you. tell me about your process on this. Like what got you wanting to do this? And, um, and yeah, and, and, yeah, well, so what got me wanting to do this is I have I had been wanting to do a documentary for a while. It actually, strangely enough, it came to me it um it came to me during a psychedelic experience. I got the the inspiration during a psychedelic experience to to do, to do a documentary. It was just going to start out as just one big like one or uh, one or two hour episode about a, a bunch of different paranormal things that I covered with a bunch of different guests but I got the inspiration to actually do some traveling with this and I decided to make it a whole series and I wanted to travel across the United States starting starting in the United States and cover some of the strange happenings occult historical events paranormal history hot spots across the United States that you might not hear as much about and interview the experts and the witnesses and people I've talked to before and make it a, a visual presentation in a documentary series. And I thought, what better place to start than my hometown or my home state of Louisiana? So in April, I decided to get it going. And uh, thanks to a bunch of folks that helped out with donations and production assistance, we we're able to get equipment and gas money and go out there and we'll be needing to raise money for the next episode. But this, this one is, I am so grateful that we got this one finished and we went out to Louisiana. We did some filming. We went to New Orleans, saw some sites, plantations, did some interviews with experts and tour guides and witnesses and the most incredible witnesses of some of the most amazing cryptid encounters I've ever heard about, especially one particular witness named Scott Pace, who has who is he's he's still having experiences, new experiences, and they're evolving. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go. And this is, he's one of the main highlights of my docu series, and he's going to be in the whole Louisiana season because Louisiana has got a whole season. It's going to be, this first episode is just episode one of season one. Season one is a cult Louisiana. Episode one is older than history. And we'll get into a bit about why it's titled that in a second. So Scott is my main experiencer, and he's got incredible cryptid experiences, which we'll get into a little bit. And the documentary f this uh, season will focus on lo cult Louisiana history that we don't know about, including the Native Americans, the mounds, a little bit about the, the slavery in the area, and then the paranormal residue because of this dark energy there and a little bit about voodoo and pirate history and some of the unknown happenings there's a lot about the jfk assassination that was going down in new orleans a lot of mob activity so we're going to get into all kinds of stuff that yet i ended up getting so much information and so much footage and finding out so much about my home state that I thought this was just going to be one episode as well about Louisiana, but no, this is going to be a whole season. We've got all kinds of amazing things going into this, this series here and all kinds of amazing people that participated in it. And uh, so, yeah, I'm really excited to get it out there and I'm sure you'll have the, the, the link down there for people to, to go and download it. But yeah, man, we can get into any of the amazing things that I covered in there, if whatever you want to yeah, start with. Uh, yeah, what I wanted to talk about was you grew up there, so you would know this pretty well. Like the culture there, I've always I see. Like I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which is like it's like almost like a complete different culture than than down there. So I've always been like really fascinated with like your your state's culture, like with the voodoo and hoodoo, and the you know the there, there's like it seems like there's like a Native American uh, element to it, a French, a Spanish element, um, a uh, a Haitian or, or an, yeah. an African. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit, like the paranormal side, but just like the cultural. Um, uh, aspect down there you know what i mean yeah it's a, it's a cultural melting pot and i myself in a, am a mix of all kinds of stuff uh they call it uh cajun they call it uh cajun mutts uh coon ass is another name <laughs> for us down in louisiana but if we yeah a mix of french and haitian and all kinds of different cultures here and um 
my background is is mostly French, um, French, and uh, French Canadian type of blood mix. But uh, my dad was actually just born in France, came down here, and the 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 voodoo culture from not only the the slavery that occurred there but Haiti but there is also like I cover in the documentary there's a huge native american culture down there and there still is and there's a there's a, about four or five recognized tribes that still are residing in communities in louisiana and we what we focus on in the documentary is that there were also civilizations that are much older than what we understand as the natives that were there and these some believe are the descendants of atlantis and some also believe that these could have been very large individuals and that these tribes were the very first mound builders that were a global civilization that were building these mounds and these mounds were actually the prototypes for the pyramids. And as I get into in the documentary, some amazing discoveries recently about the mounds in Louisiana that are actually older than any mounds anywhere else in the world right now. And they just recently discovered this a couple of years ago. The mounds at the LSU campus are, I believe, they were originate in 9,000 BC, which is like 11,000 years ago. These mounds were built and they believe that this, the earliest civilizations that may have been descendants of Atlantis and the early Sumerian culture may have been a global civilization and built these mounds. And they believe there's also speculation that the leaders of these these communities or these tribal people were very, very tall people where you get the mythos of the Nephilim or the giants. And there's also evidence that these mounds were burial mounds for some of these giants. Many giant skeletons were excavated from these mounds. And you don't hear a lot about that because the Smithsonian had a huge campaign to excavate thousands of mounds in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and they they covered up all the large skeletons. And they only reported a few. They reported a few seven-foot, maybe seven-and-a-half-foot skeletons, but there were thousands of newspaper reports about 10 to 12-foot tall skeletons being found, if some even tall, up to 15 foot uh, tall skeletons being excavated out of some of these mounds. So that is one of the most fascinating aspects. And that's why we call it old history, because the history in Louisiana goes back much further than you'd ever hear about in any of your, your modern academia or textbooks. And the cultures could possibly go back to the dawning of civilization, which I find absolutely amazing so yeah that's uh, that's one one thing that we focused on there well but one thing well, i noticed you, well, a couple things I, I picked up from what you said i noticed in the documentary you had greg little in there yeah. i've been following his work for so long man he's i think if you're going to have an expert regarding mounds i would say i'd rather i'd ra either have him or la marzoli or both you know what i mean but greg little i tried to get la he unfortunately declined but hey i i'm so happy i got dr gregory little he was my first choice anyway yeah, they're, those they're, he's like one of the best, I think. Like, mm. and, when, and another thing I was gonna say is, um, I have a connection somewhat to these mounds, but not really. Like, okay, so like I'm from Pittsburgh, right? So mm. like the Serpent Mounds, like right near my, like it's like the Serpent Mounds, like maybe a, like an hour or two away from my house. It's in um, Ohio. It, but like, what's weird about like the state up here is like Pittsburgh, Ohio, and West Virginia are like all basically like connected. You can be in one part of Pittsburgh and just cross right over into Ohio or West Virginia. And the Serpent Mound's like right there. Mm. So I've always been like interested in these mounds. But what's interesting is what, what they found at your mounds, they found at these mounds too. They found, I mean, this is, I think this is coming from L.A. Morzoli. I can't remember, but I think he said they found giant bones up in the, up at the Serpent Mound too. Yeah, like, yeah. What's weird is like, I wonder why they, they, they found all these giant bones buried at the sites of the mounds. Do you think they just died there? I mean, if you had to speculate, or do you think there, there can go, you know, other giants buried them there or like, what, or do you think it was because of the cataclysm or, or what, what do you, if you had to guess? I, I mean, had, if I had to guess, 
I think that we had a global civilization where we had very large people, maybe not even just the leaders, that we had a global civilization where everybody was larger. Even the animals were probably larger. It was just the the way that our, our planet was made up and maybe the atmosphere was different, but it allowed a lot larger things to thrive. And I think that the civilizations before the natives, these 11,000, 12,000 year old civilizations were advanced, but not advanced in a way where they had like spaceships and all this super advanced technology and med beds and stuff. They just had a more type of efficient energetic type of technology, maybe frequency based, but they knew how to build very uh, incredible uh, structures and they knew how to to build structures that would last very very long times and like we talked about in the documentary these mounds may have been prototypes for the pyramids but i believe the mounds themselves were also very in more impressive structures than we see now. I mean, we just see when we look at them now, they just look out like hills with little, you know, plateaus on the top. But I think back at, during the time when these mounds were what they were supposed to be, they were very impressive pyramid looking structures. And I believe that the remnants of some of these giants may have been buried in the remnants of the mounds as a sign of maybe respect or, or worship because I believe that the remnants of the giants were worshipped by the next maybe post-flood generation. And they had some few remnants after this. Maybe a cataclysm happened, wiped out most of the giants. Then a new civilization comes along and starts building over the mounds because they can't recreate it. Because civilization is starting over. But they still have remnants of giants. And they know giants are associated with the mounds. So maybe they bury them as a sign of worship or respect in some of these mounds. And that's why we find them across the globe, the giants buried. It's just my own theory on that. I don't, we don't know the answers to this. No one knows the answers to this, but it's so interesting that the, there, there have been large skeletons tied to these for sure. Yeah. So um, th this is a little bit off the documentary, but it's, 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 it's in line, right in line with kind of what you said. So, cause I noticed you had Jason Brashears on your show recently. Yeah. Um, and, and I've talked to him before about like the simulation, the vapor canopy. He thinks that we were, once we were in a vapor canopy, which yeah. caused everything to grow bigger. Do you agree with that? Or what do you think? I think it's a possibility, man. I think he's got some great theories. I don't agree with everything he says, but I think, like many of my guests, many of your guests, everybody has a piece of the puzzle. And I think it's very possible that we lived in a very different type of planet at one point where it allowed the growth of life to be much larger and taller than we are experiencing now. And we still have tall people and there's some <laughs> there's some speculation like I talk about later in my documentary that there could still be giants around the planet maybe in hiding underground but one of the most interesting stories i've heard recently which is we discussed this in the doc is i had tony merkel on and he talks about one of his friends from louisiana was exploring the swamps after a hurricane opened up a channel that people hadn't gone to in they don't know how many years it was it was a very desolate remote area that opened up a new area of the swamp where people hadn't been in a while or maybe ever i'm sure it had been explored at some point but it hadn't been explored in a very long time these people are there i believe they're two fishermen or hunters or something and they're going out there and they claim that they see an extremely large humanoid that is peeking behind a tree and they said it had to be at least 15 maybe even 20 foot tall looking oh at them God. from yeah from behind a tree and they hauled tail out of there but that I've heard these stories before from desolate from from deep in these remote areas of the swamps of very tall humanoids, but most of those go back to Bigfoot, which is another huge part of my documentary from my witness Scott Pace, who's had these cryptid encounters and experiences, as well as other witnesses that I've interviewed, that these Bigfoots can grow up to 10, 15 possibly 20 foot tall could these guys be the remnants of the giants i think that's possible as well 
Yeah, and 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 you 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 didn't just cover Bigfoot in the doc. You covered um, Dogman, which they call. I guess they call down in New Orleans. They call it the Rougarou, right? Is that uh, the Rougarou? Yes, man, the Dogman. Yeah. I Can remember you ask growing question? up. Yeah. What, what was that? Was it? What, what, I was going to say you said wait, when you were growing up, like because I I was I didn't hear of Dogman until I was like much older, like because I, I used to listen to Art Bell, and it wasn't something that was regularly covered on Art Bell. But then it seems like like. A couple of things. I don't know if you've noticed this because you've been in the paranormal for a while, but like I think these stories were all around us. But like with the with the invention of the internet, you start to see all of a sudden you start to see more stories of shadow people. You start to see more stories of dog man. I don't know if this is because more people have access to information, so they can obviously start telling their stories and sharing their experiences. Because I believe both of them are a real phenomena. I believe. You know, whether shadow people or sleep paralysis or whatever it is, I believe some people are experiencing something. And I seriously believe that with Dogman, too. I, be, I don't think all these people would, you know, because a lot of times it's like the guy in your documentary, like he didn't want any, like it wasn't like he was looking for fame or anything like that. He just wanted to get his story out. And, and that's yeah. what I find so amazing about this. But what, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I want to touch on the, the phenomena part where more people are, witnessing experiencing things like dog man I, I i've considered the possibility that maybe a lot of the paranormal that people experience is i don't want to say it's an egregore or sort of archetype or thought form that we created but it could be a doorway to perception once like scott my witness once he experienced and witnessed these creatures for the first time it opened up something in his perception and then he started seeing them all over the place and they start even coming into his house and he starts hearing their <laughs> calls all the time. And not only that, they're psychically talking and communicating with him. So then now he's having experiences with extraterrestrials, which we can get into. He's <laughs> so had some incredible experiences with extraterrestrials and it all stemmed from a sighting of a Bigfoot and dog man at the same time crazy enough but like you said this guy's not trying he's not making stuff up. he's not trying to get notoriety he had no idea about any of this stuff before he had his experience and once he had it it just cracked his perception open he starts seeing dog man and he ha he does go out and look for this stuff now because he's fascinated by it and he doesn't feel threatened by it because he interacts with mostly the bigfoot creatures the dog man was mainly one experience Besides some type of he's he had some crazy extraterrestrial experiences with dog man, which we can get into if you want a little bit. But yeah, man, I think that that once you start to experience some of the even aliens, uh, what you consider extraterrestrials or you have your own paranormal experience, it may crack open something in your perception where your awareness is broadened now and you can experience some of this stuff. So that's possible. Do you think it, it might be something with the frequency of the person? Like, have you ever thought about that? Like that maybe like their frequencies at a, like naturally, like maybe they're, 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 yeah, they're, they're able to see beyond the veil for some reason. Like I've always wondered what it is about the experience or that they're able to, because here's the, here's the thing, man. I I've had a couple like small paranormal experiences, more, more of my stuff that I've witnessed is, come from like psychedelic experiences like it takes me it takes i'm sorry to say but it takes that to open my perception up like i go out every night and i look for ufos i've never saw one i've never mm. saw one. i would be honest if i did and i would tell people but like right. you know, i also want to be honest and say i haven't seen one yet and what's interesting is i just had a guy i think he was on your show do you did you have ryan fusco on your show yes yeah, so a long time a couple years ago yeah He's, he's from Pittsburgh here. Mm -hmm. Okay. He's, he, I, 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 I thought I, I saw him on uh, somewhere in dreamland podcast. And so I decided to invite him on because I saw he was from Pittsburgh, but like he covers all that stuff, like Bigfoot dog, man, owl man and stuff. And uh, where, where was I? Go? I, was, I was wondering where I was going with that. Well, I, I guess I was saying like, do you think it's something in the experience or that, that, that enables them to see beyond the veil that like someone like me isn't getting like, or that maybe well, I'm the same I'm as you, man. I don't go around seeing all kind of crazy stuff. It took, meditate deep meditation and psychedelics for me to really have these profound experiences i do i do have profound synchronicities that are, occur all the time i consider my life to be magical at times i consider that there are things that have happened to me that i should have been left dead plenty of times and the universe i believe has 
uh, taking care of me, if you could say, plenty of times. So I think there's a very magical aspect and very even paranormal aspect to our reality on a daily basis. But as far as seeing like un these creatures and things like that, no, I haven't either. And most of the planet is the same way. Most of us do <laughs> not see any of this stuff. And it could be. Maybe it's his vibration because you know what? He is a very... Uh, you could say religious man. He's he's a church going fellow. He goes to church every Sunday. And what he started doing uh, shortly after he started having these experiences is he'd go out to the woods and he would start reading Bible verses and singing gospel hymns to the Bigfoots and to the creatures. And he said he'd get responses from them. They'd peek around the trees. They like communicate that they enjoyed when he'd go out there and do this. So I don't know. Maybe he is vibrating at some kind of level that maybe the the rest of us aren't. That that. That's a possibility, man, for sure. So, I, I mean, this wasn't in the documentary, but you said he's had like ET experiences too, or what? What we would call ET experiences. <laughs> this this will be in the second or third part, so I'm not going to give too much away about this. But yes, he. Uh, <clears throat> I'll go ahead and give your audience a little taste of what happened in the first one, so we can lead up to that. But he had an experience. Where this all started when he was in a deer blind, which is a little deer stand for hunting. He was waiting to catch some dinner and he saw it. His, he said he's, his gun started vibrating and he started getting this weird feeling. And he looked out and he saw wood. He looked like a man with covered in hair, very large, huge man, covered in black hair and dreadlocked hair at that. And he looked very dirty. And he, he initially snapped the picture and then he looked through his rifle scope and he could see that it was a Bigfoot. I mean, there was undeniable that there was like a seven or eight foot tall, huge man covered in hair from head to toe that and his skin was black and his, the hair was black and it had dreaded nappy hair all over it. And then he just gets this sense of dread and he thinks to point his rifle over the opposite direction and he sees unmistakably a werewolf a dog man the rugaru and he said this thing wasn't quite as tall as the bigfoot but it was massive it was pretty tall enough and it uh it was communicate it started tel telepathically communicating to him and he said this this werewolf this dog man warned him that if he doesn't get out of there he's going to go to the deer stand and tear him apart and then the Bigfoot, he can he sense that the Bigfoot's communicating as well, saying, no, he's not pointing the gun at us to, to harm us. He's just looking at us. And he says that there's like a back and forth in his mind between the dogman and Bigfoot. So he doesn't know what to do. All he can think of is to try and communicate back through his mind. He says, no, I'm not doing I'm, I'm just looking, man. I'm leaving. <laughs> so he's terrified at this point, and he hauls ass out of the deer blind. But he says he can sense that there's there's more of these things, more than just what he saw, those two creatures that are following him out. He looks back, and he can see, like, four hairy figures behind him. He doesn't know if they were all Bigfoots or all dogmen or a mix of both. But he hauled ass out of there. And that was it, man. After this experience, it opened up something in him, and he... Like I said, he did. He was very fascinated and very interested, but it started after that. He would have kind of these intruders in his house, these invisible intruders that he could tell someone in his house. He could see the inventions on the floor. He could see people walking. He could smell the, the Bigfoot odor, and he'd sometimes see them peeking in his windows from outside. So sometimes these things would get curious, walk through his house. But he would never see them. And that which leads him to believe that they have some sort of cloaking ability or some sort of ability to change our perception to where we cannot see them. And he says most of the time when he does see them, this eye shine and they're they're peeking out from behind a tree. There's been a few times where he has actually seen the full physical Bigfoot, like on his first initial encounter. And there was one time where he was in his truck and a Bigfoot tried to grab his cell phone out of his hand and walked right past the truck. <laughs> that was an incredible experience. Uh, but the as, as far as the dog man, I think that was the only main encounter he'd had a, a, a more, I guess, physical encounter that he'd have with these, with that being particularly, and it cracked him open. And eventually, and this is just recently, his first, that, that first experience happened about a year and a half ago, I believe. And he, he started doing interviews very shortly after, just because he was encouraged to by one of his friends who does a podcast. And then I heard it, I had to get him on. And now he's in the documentary. 
but he's such a humble man. He's like, he's right now, he's just declining to do any interviews. He's not trying to get out there and become famous or just, you know, tr not trying to get any notoriety. But eventually after the Bigfoot thing, he started having missing time and he would wake up in the next, the next day with memories of sometimes being escorted what it seems like through underground catacombs he would have memories of what he remembers as gray extraterrestrials standing over him or standing next to him, insect looking beings standing next to him. And oddly enough, a Bigfoot would be there or sometimes a dog man would be like standing guard. He said, it seems like these beings have a relationship with each other. He said, it also seems like at times the dog man is subservient to the Bigfoot and the other beings which I find this is so interesting. And I don't know if, you know, he's, he believes these experiences. That is for sure. And I believe that he believes them. And I can't say a hundred percent if, if this is really happening, but the fact that he is who he is and the way he portrays himself and the witnesses he has and his, his girlfriend backs it up and the other people have, they have, collaborated his story some of them have seen these beings with him some of them have heard these and he's gone on multiple outings with multiple people and they have all seen these creatures he said one night he was out there and a beam this is a physical experience a waking experience one his other friend was with him saw this a beam of light shot out the sky and two seven or eight foot tall light beings stepped out of the the beam and just walked across a clearing in front of where they were just like they didn't even notice them. And uh, yeah, man. So he's, he starts having all these incredible experience. He's has this one experience that he just recently had that I'm not going to give away, but he actually had an invasion into his house, but it was a, it was a benevolent experience. They weren't like, you know, trying to home invade aliens invasion the house or anything, but he had a long conversation with non-humans recently uh, that actually woke him up in the night. And, this is an in absolutely incredible experience. I'm actually having him on. We're going to do a little podcast about that experience next in the next couple of weeks, I think in about two or three weeks. So look out for that one. But Scott's amazing. And he's, he's had some incredible experience and they keep getting weirder and weirder. <laughs> That's fascinating. Okay. So um, before we move on to something else, I wanted to see if there was anything else you wanted to cover from the documentary. There was one, one other thing I wanted to touch on, but if you don't want to cover it, it's fine. Cause I know you don't want to probably give away too much, but I was just going to mention the, the pagan festival or not, not the yeah. pagan festival, but the pagan celebrations going back to the new Orleans culture. I thought that was really interesting that there were actually like pagan ceremonies, but beyond like, I know there's like a big Wicca or Wic Wiccan community and a voodoo community in New Orleans, but it's, it's deeper than that. Like, well, you know, it is because Mardi Gras is really celebrated as a Christian holiday. That's what most folks believe that they're celebrating a Christian holiday, but the roots go back to Saturnalia and mainly Lupercalia, which was an ancient Greek festival of fertility. And they did animal sacrifice. Some believe that there was even human sacrifice carried out at some of these, gatherings and festivals there was orgies it was very sexually fueled and this is where it's very interesting it ties to the rougarou because there is a lot of the werewolf myths come out of this time period during lupercalia during these celebrations because they would celebrate dogs and there's a myth that zeus turned his lycon which was the king of Arcadia into a wolf because he was unsatisfied with something that he was doing at the time. And I believe that this is where a lot of the werewolf and Rugaru even myths come from. And which eventually this whole Lupercalia evolved to, to Mardi Gras, which now the celebrations are celebrated with a lot of elaborate costumes. In the earlier days, there was more integration of wolf-like costumes and dog-like costumes. They still have, you know, a lot of dog and wolf type of uh, archetypal costumes and stuff in Mardi Gras, but it's just turned into anything and everything. And it's still a debaucherous festival, I'll tell you that much, that's for sure. Yeah, I wanted to tell you there's there's a I just thought of this. I I I wanted to I was I was I was gonna get okay. I wanted to get a hold of these people because I wanted to have I wanted to see if, if you would have them in your documentary because they have a really interesting New Orleans story. They wrote a book called Orbducted in the French Quarter. 
Have you heard of this? No, I have not. It's Chad and Alta, but here's the thing. Alta just died. Her, his, that was his girlfriend. Oh, no. so there's Chad, but uh, he might, I, I can, you know, it's it's a Facebook page. They just have a Facebook page for the book, but they have this experience. I had them on my show before where they said they were abducted. They were telling me about the French Quarter that they used to live in this, like, this, like, you know, like uh, underneath a a, a, a a witchcraft shop or like a voodoo shop or something like that. And like they were seeing visions of like Papa Legba at night or something. It, it was strange. Like, and then there's a whole, they call it orbduction because they got abducted in the French Quarter. But he might be open to doing the documentary. I, I can give you, because I, I think he'd yeah. be an interesting guest to have. Definitely. Like, you know, but um, what one one of the other a couple other things I wanted to fin- touch on before um we we finished up here was uh just a couple of the podcasts that you had recently because they, they were really good uh the one with Matthew Acroy I thought he brought forward some really interesting information like I can't even piece it all together like I know he was talking about Noah who's actually Atrahasis and that he, that he actually did land on Mount Ararat and that his sons went and they spread out civilization and it ended up being where Gobekli Tepe is and Karahan Tepe. Is that, is that right? Or where, well, from- one of the main takeaways I think that he was trying to, to get people to understand is lots of people believe that Atlantis came before the Sumerian culture and then Atlantis was destroyed and then we had a <laughs> rebuilding of civilization with the Sumerians. But what he was trying to portray is that he believes that the Sumerians were actually the very first very first civilization ever that ever populated this planet then they are much older than we understand now and they were the civilization that started atlantis and everything came from sumeria which is very interesting and I, it's something that i consider very highly because he's he's a brilliant researcher no one else has put together a timeline of our history like this man has it's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years that he has gone back and somehow been able to piece together to the best of his ability because there's no way you can truly know what really happened in our history and what was what was happening in the timeline of events, but he has done an amazing job of piecing together a lot of our history that has been lost and providing a picture that makes sense in this timeline that he's created. And he's, he's created, I think like a 200,000 year timeline, which is incredible. Yeah. Do you, do you think like the Anunnaki could have been some kind of like, um, like brotherhood of like, uh, who knows, who knows what, I don't want to say extraterrestrials cause we don't know, but like some people that kind of brought civilization and like spread it all over the world. Like, do you think there's, I think there's evidence for that kind of, I mean, there what, is, what you- there's evidence that there was an advanced species of humanoid, whether they came from a different planet, it's possible, or there they came from, a different dimension, which is also, I consider very much that these, these highly advanced humanoids somehow seeded civilization in a way, whether they tinkered with the DNA of hominids and were creating indeed creating humans, or they were just mating with humans and, and spreading the DNA in that way and creating civilization, teaching, their their new creations or their new spawns how to to create and to build and use mathematics and all the modern types of technology that they were providing at the time it's very possible um i think that is it would it's the easiest type of answer for the rapid advancement of our of the human race. And another, well, another possibility that I do consider is the stone date that maybe we were, uh, humanoids that were physically and biologically the same as we are now, but maybe our mental capabilities weren't quite on par until we started eating some of those crazy mushrooms that started growing out of the ground. And it changed our, our consciousness and evolved us in a way until we are what we, we, uh, our understanding is now. And I think that it's possible because I do believe that I do believe in, that psychedelics in these plant medicines do, did have a part to play in our overall consciousness evolution in some way. 
I, I agree. I would. I definitely agree. Oh, I want, another thing I definitely wanted to touch on was uh, I, I watched your podcast. Like, I, okay, like I'll just start with by prefacing this. I've always been a big rap music fan. I think growing up in our generation, like you, you, it's come something you grow up with, right? And I still listen to a lot of rap music. Like I'm guilty of it, right? But then I watched your. Um, your 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 video the other day that was like the truth behind gangster rap and Tupac yeah, yeah. and stuff. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I thought that was really interesting. Well, it is. I the gentleman that Hamilton and his wife Rose, they have a YouTube channel and I can't remember the name of it right now. But um, go to my channel and find the. the it's a recent episode I did about the uh, culture cre gangster rap culture creation. And he was basically he had done he's did this did a documentary about the truth behind the death of Tupac, and it's very interesting the theories that he's come up with. Basically, that the whole era behind gangster rap was an operation to to shift humanity, uh, particularly the black communities into a certain direction. And it's very obvious once you start looking at the big picture of everything that happened during that time period, that that was what was going on. And they were basically using these young rap artists to portray a certain lifestyle and get these, get culture to be shifted into a certain direction by creating this gangster rap music and providing this new ideology and the a new direction that they wanted these the the black community basically to go and it's a way that to destroy communities basically and we've seen this we're seeing this now with some of the the new pop music and the direction that we're going with sexualization of of children and sexualization of the the younger generations and even outright satanism and seeming luciferianism in some of the entertainment business and they they touched on a lot of that and there was a lot of connections they made a lot of connections to uh, the catholic church and what we see as the Im uh, symbolism and imagery that's portrayed in a lot of modern rap and hip-hop culture because they believe there is a dark marriage between the entertainment business and the Catholic church. Because uh, if you've watched my show for any amount of time, we've, we've uncovered horrific truths about the, the true nature of the Catholic church and the inversion that they've done to spirituality from the, the dawning of the Catholic religion and some of these Abrahamic religions in general, where they, portray themselves in a certain way when it's very a very dark occult practice that they are recruiting people into and it and this was a huge part of changing culture and recruiting certain people into a dark dark lifestyle and it was very interesting uh, one one thing that i wanted to mention that i thought was interesting i can see them trying to destroy culture because you know, like they did that with like, we know, I, I don't want to say the name, but like three letter agencies flooded the hood type areas or like, you know, like the ghetto type areas with crack cocaine yeah. and they went and arrested people for selling it. And like, you know, it was a whole setup against, you know, cultures. And I think it wasn't even, I think it was more against the poor, you know, it's more against, I don't want to single out any culture. Cause like, I don't want to, you know, I think it was more against the poor. Cause I grew up in poor neighborhoods where I saw well, it was, man. I mean, it's always been a class war. There is, but there's a huge race aspect to it. They were targeting black people and black families and they're, they're targeting black families in our modern times with the destruction of the family unit in many different ways, but they're also targeting poor people and wipe everybody they want to just basically destroy what we understand as a family unit but yeah man it's it's always been a class war and that's something that people need to understand it's not about race it's not about who we are it's not about our differences culturally it's about these elitist scumbags versus the rest of the world and that's I, I i i couldn't agree more i i thought it was uh i thought that's really well said oh and the and the last uh topic i wanted to touch on before we get out of here is uh howdy mikowski i've had him on my show i think twice i like the things to the table like uh what did you take away from that like I, he has some really interesting information 
He does, man. I, I I like what he's looked at, what he's uncovered about the the world's fairs and the possible false historical timelines and some of the things behind that. One of the most fascinating aspects is that we could have had a recent global reset, whether it was intentionally caused or it's something natural that our elite globalist society knew about and were prepared for. And when the cataclysm occurred, we repopulated, basically repopulated the planet with, with children, with orphan trains, which is very interesting because you can look back a lot of historical pictures during that time period and it's all children, like children working in mines. So that was like one of the really most interesting aspects and that he brought to the table along with the possibility of the technology that could have been available even much more recently than we think. And like I said, it's not like the technology that we think of today with computers and social media and all that bullshit. This was healing technologies that could have gone into cathedrals that these, these ancient cathedrals could have been used as healing centers and possibly broadcasted out of the cities and just the technology that they were displaying at the world fairs, the, the fact that they had human zoos where they would basically display people, uh, tr either tribal people that they had kidnapped or taken from their homes and just to show how primitive they were and how uh, proper and elite that society has become and we should never go back to this and it was awful the things that they were just doing to human beings during this time period for the purpose of displaying supposedly a fair that displayed this technology that they were they, and it was not clear for the, the purpose that they were supposedly displaying some of this stuff were they displaying it to show off a, a previous civilization that they had were they trying to display it as possible future technologies we don't know but the fact is they destroyed everything and we will never find out what the, the true reason why they were displaying some of these things at the world's fair a lot of people speculated the buildings were just very cheaply made uh materials that could have been easily destroyed but there's evidence that that's not true that some of these buildings were very advanced construction and this that the whole thing was put together in a very short amount of time but there's like howdy presents there's evidence that this is also was just remnants of an advanced civilization that they were trying to get rid of for some reason so very interesting stuff it is and especially you know what's what's real shady about it is the fact that they blew all that shit up like the day after right like or, or maybe not the day after, but they blew it all up in like, a short amount of time yeah shit. i just i just i think that kind of gives red flags right there to like something more else was going on, kind of like everything that you just alluded to, that maybe they were trying to shape the perception of people. And and because mm. he from what how do you explain? I remember him telling me he thought that like a lot of the people that were able to afford to go to those things were a lot of like teachers and you know, maybe college professors, and then they would go back and tell their town what they saw. So that kind of like shaped the perception of how people thought about people. And that could create race divinity or div mm -hmm. div I'm sorry, race dividedness and all kinds of other stuff. Right. I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that they only allowed the people that would buy into it or the society's elite that already had an idea or maybe even knew outright what was really going on. Because if you think about it, if there was only the society's elite left and people that they knew were trusting to go along with the, the reformation of the planet and this new type of new, new world order at the time that maybe it was just for them that they were displaying these things too and the rest of the world was just at the time being repopulated by ch it's so by children it's so interesting though and like how he said he doesn't have the stories from the native americans about this and that is one thing that's missing from this whole if he could get tellings of what the their ancestors saw during that time we could get a more accurate picture if indeed we did have advanced cities and civilizations and it like how he also believes we it could have been the civilization could have been like a remnants of a Roman type empire that had a, a global stronghold across the planet. So we don't know. Yeah. It's interesting though. 
It's a, it really is. Like, um, well, I, that's all the questions I have. We've been going about an hour. Is there anything else you wanted to cover before we finish up, or did you just want to promote your stuff or whatever, whatever you want to do? Yeah, man. Uh, I just I hope everyone goes out. If you have that the the link to the doc there, go download it. It's only five bucks, and this is just the first episode of many many to come. I'm gonna try and have episode two for Occult Louisiana out within about two to three months from now. I need to take a little break here because I am the only one producing and editing and filming and doing everything with all this stuff. So it's a lot of work. Uh, also, if you, you, we could still use your help and support with this. I'm completely self-funded. I, I am basically running off of my podcast revenue and any donations I have from my audience. So if you would like to help out with production, we have a website. You can go to supportfkn.com or just buy a copy of the, the documentary episode. That would be a great way to support us. Um, and that's, I think that's about it, man. We've got some really cool stuff coming up in the future. Really fun shows coming up. And Robert, thank you so much for having me on. This was great. I just want to make sure I have the right um, link in the description. I have the buy me a coffee slash um, forbidden news documentary. It's I, it's in the description. Um, yeah. Is there a link to the actual episode two or how do how did that, how does that work? Like, so they go, they, uh, Oh yeah. Let me, <laughs> I'm glad you said that it may get a little confusing for you, but it's, it's really easy. All you have to do is click the link, the buy me a coffee. It'll bring you to the buy me a coffee website. And if you go to the extra section there, that is where you can directly download the forbidden documentary. We got a regular version for five bucks and a 4k version. If you'd like for $7 on there. So that's how you get it. And we will, we'll have it uh, available on different platforms. Yeah. I'm so glad you said this. We'll have a uh, rock fin on Monday. It's going to really premiere out everywhere else on Vimeo and we'll have it for uh, download pay-per-view on Rockfin. Rockfin has a cool little pay-per-view thing. We'll have it. It's going to be five bucks wherever you go. And eventually we will have it on Amazon. That's going to take a little while for the approval on stuff on that. But uh, for now you can, there's plenty of other places, ways and places that you can get the documentary. You can also get it on our website. Just go to forbiddenknowledge.news and you can, the link to the buy me a coffee is right there. And like I said, just go to the extras section and you can download it from right there. And, and I, I'll just add in that like, you know, I don't know if you guys know this, all you guys that are watching right now, Chris was kicked off YouTube because of speaking truth. So yeah. it's important that you support him because he's really trying to speak truth and like, you know, that that's, he's trying to rebuild right now. He has a clips. He has a forbidden knowledge news clips channel on YouTube, which I have the link in the description, but it's a rebuilding process, you know, and I can, I, I don't know if I lost my shit tomorrow, like, you know, that would, that would, you know, so I wouldn't want to, man, I, it, <laughs> it was a blow, but the thing with me is I had been preparing for it for a long time because I had been teetering on the edge for years. They'd give me one strike, two strike, and I'd be very careful for a long time and just not, but I was preparing. I'm like, audience go somewhere else. We're not going to be on YouTube. And when they zapped me, it wasn't like a huge heartbreak. <laughs> Although we had almost 40,000 subscribers, it was, it hurt, but it wasn't like they had demonetized us within uh, in, in like 2018. So we had been making money on YouTube in a long time. So it was mainly just to, to promote our stuff. So I am so glad you still have your channel. And I think, man, you may even be in the clear these days because it doesn't seem like they're going as hard on, on, on people now for whatever reason, now that COVID's over and all the other fiasco, it doesn't seem like they're going hard as hard on people. So you might be out of the water. And I know Ryder, my friend, he just got monetized on YouTube. So, Hey, maybe uh, we, we might have a new place to come back to. I don't know. Well, well may, may, the re here's what I thought about this, Chris, and this might have been something we could talk about off air, but I, I'll just say it in front of the audience. I was thinking maybe, and I don't, I watch, I'll probably get a strike tomorrow because like, <laughs> that's how, that's how we, 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 that's how this matrix works. Right. But no, but yeah. what I was thinking was maybe it's because like, there's other things opening up like Rockfin starting to take a lot of people. Rumble starting to take a lot of people. Odyssey starting to take a lot of people. So maybe, and, and plus let's be honest, YouTube just lost Joe Rogan too, which was probably millions of dollars worth of revenue. 
I mean, yeah. probably I'm, I'm so like them losing Joe Rogan was a, I mean, him going to Spotify. I don't, I watch Joe Rogan. I sometimes think he's controlled opposition, mm -hmm. but I digress. Cause I'm a big mixed martial arts fan. So I still, well, I, tell I, still, you, I just, know. I think, I think I know what they're doing. And I just think that they don't care. I think they don't care if they're losing money right now. I think that Hollywood doesn't care. I think all these big tech companies do not care if they're losing money because it, it hasn't become about, Making money it hasn't become about making a profit anymore. It is all purely about propaganda. It is about pushing whatever type of woke agenda is out there. And the next big problem, the next big fear campaign that we'll be facing. And that is, that's all it is. And if you don't, you know, if you don't play ball with that, you're not, you're not welcome on any of this stuff. So, you know, that that's what's happening. And, uh, I think that we're in a very interesting time and people need to, you know, because people like yourself has, are, are so successful on YouTube. Uh, you know, it's great to have these options, but the, for the people that got kicked off, we need to still support them too. I mean, all you got to do is put a different web address in your, in your server. There's just too many people who are stuck on the YouTube thing. It's still such a big, huge platform. There's too many people that, that are, that's their only, you know, that's their only source of entertainment right now is, is going to YouTube and looking for this stuff and all their favorite channels have been on there. So it's, it, it is hard for people to switch, but I think we do need to support the smaller stuff and you're right. Rumble and, and Rockfin are, are growing a good bit, but uh, support those independent platforms too. I always say to people, every time I, everybody's, every time someone asks me about Rockfin, I'm like, dude, like if you subscribe to Rockfin, you know, you like, you get Sam Tripoli's tinfoil hat. You get Chris Matthews for Ben Nod's news, and I'm on there now. I don't post much anything different than what I post on here because mm. I haven't really went outside the box. Because you know, it's like I don't know. I, I just I, some of the stuff I, I had to take three videos down last week because I thought they were getting close. I was like, I'm probably going to get hit for this, so I took them down. <laughs> I put them on Rumble. to do that. Yeah, you know. So, but I mean, so I put them on Rumble and Rockfin. So, like, I always tell the audience, but like, and there's uh, there's like um I'm trying to think of the girl's name. I, I love her show, Rogue Ways. Lindsay Sharma. Yeah, she's Lindsay. On Rockfin too. She's awesome. Like, so there's a lot of awesome people on Rockfin. So I would say it's definitely worth going and subscribing to Rockfin. Like, you're gonna get a a, a ton of cool creators. Is Ryder on there too? Is Ryder on? Ryder's Rockfin? on Rockfin. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, guys, if you're hearing this, that's Sam Tripoli, who does Conspiracy Social Club and Tinfoil Hat. Then there's Chris, who does Forbidden Knowledge News. And then all the shows that Chris provides. That's one thing we didn't talk about. Real quick, like, can you tell people real quick about, like, the Forbidden Knowledge News Network? Because I've had Karen yeah. on my show a couple of times. But, like, you have a whole network where you're promoting other podcasts as well, right? Yes, and that's something I started doing a couple of years ago. And it started with... Writer, actually, writer from Raised by Giants, his show, we were talking and we, we thought, why not help promote and feature some of our my other favorite podcasts and my friends that were, were in this field trying to, to get some exposure. And Forbidden Knowledge News was starting to pick up a little bit, so we decided to, on our website and all our social media, and we created the Forbidden Knowledge Network's own social media stuff, and we, we featured about 10 or 12 other podcasts that have some of our good friends like raised by giants with the frick live understanding propaganda. Like you said, the quantum guide show with Karen Holton, they got BG cast. They got a bunch of other shows on there. Amazing shows that we, we feature their feed on our website and we put clips up on all our social media and uh, we just help these guys get out there and uh, spread the love on everything. So yeah, go check that out. That's, that's also just on our website, forbidden knowledge news. That's awesome. Well, thanks, Chris. This was this was really awesome, and uh, thank you everybody for, for tuning sure. in tonight. And uh, yeah, this this was amazing, man. Until next time. All right, thanks everybody. Have a good night.